Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, John and Zilutoli, for joining in. Uh, we'll begin class. Uh, can I ask John to uh, lead in prayer, please? Sure, of course. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we submit us into your mighty presence. Lord, we pray as we learn today that your word go inside our hearts, inside our minds, and let it bring its fruit, Lord Jesus. And we pray that we would be with an open heart to receive from you. And we also step in for Selena to your mighty hands and ask, Lord Jesus, that you would speak through her and let your voice be heard in our ears, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so last class, last Wednesday, we had uh, begun looking at the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit, uh, chapter 8. We looked at... Uh, uh, the humanity of Christ, and before that, we just uh, uh, kind of did a quick recap of what we had learned in Christology about uh, uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ and his humanity. And uh, then we started looking at uh, uh, Lesson 8, um, the points given there in the notes, and we looked at the humanity of Christ. Uh, we looked at Christ's uh, virgin birth and the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth, uh, as we saw in three areas. Um, and we looked at uh, that, uh, you know, the, that um, salvation must ultimately come from the Lord. Uh, salvation cannot be um, uh, brought about by any human effort, human will. Um, but it's completely uh, the work of God. It is uh, brought about by his power and by his, uh, uh, his uh, what he had planned uh, and his will. And so it's completely the work of God and it's, there is no human effort in the work of salvation. And we, the second area we saw was that the virgin birth made it possible uh, to unite uh, deity and humanity in one person that is in Jesus Christ. So uh, we see that in Jesus, um, uh, he was, um, you know, uh, fully man, fully God. He was 100% God, 100% man. We see that in him, uh, full humanity and full deity existed in perfect unity and in oneness. And it was made possible because of the virgin birth, uh, because he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And also virgin birth made it possible that uh, Christ was, uh, uh, you know, did not, uh, was truly human in the sense that he did not inherit any um, sin. Uh, unlike us who we are uh, born in sin, we inherited sin uh, because we are born to, uh, you know, uh, we were born in sin. Uh, our, um, uh, you know, we inherited from our uh, forefathers right up to Adam. But even if, uh, you know, Jesus, even though Jesus came in, uh, in the lineage of Adam, uh, but we see he did not descend from Adam the same way as we human beings did. Uh, and uh, uh, he inherited no sin in him. It was because of the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that prevented the transfer of sin from Mary to Jesus. Okay. Then we looked at his human weaknesses and uh, limitations. We saw that uh, he was, uh, Jesus was tight. He was just like us. Um, you know, with uh, all the human frailties, weaknesses, uh, uh, he faced temptation. But uh, uh, even though he was human, just like us in every way, but he was sinless and he remained sinless. He did not commit any sin, even though he was tempted, you know, uh, he overcame temptation. Of course, there is one, only one recorded temptation in Matthew chapter 4, but I'm sure Jesus would have. Uh, you know, uh, gone through various other temptations. And, um, you know, he's our faithful high priest who's able to, uh, uh, you know, help us in our time of weakness, in our time of uh, when we go through temptation. It's because he became one uh, like us. Uh, he lived, uh, uh, you know, in our human body. He knows our human frailties and difficulties. Uh, he knows our human limitations as well. And he's able to um, help us. He's able to strengthen us. He's able to um, uh, help us overcome uh, our weaknesses and our frailties and our temptations. And he understands. Uh, so we saw some of the uh, 
his human weaknesses and limitations that uh, he was you know, born just like any one of us as a baby. He grew up to be a child, went through a childhood and then to adulthood. Uh, he became tired just like um, any of us do. Um, we see, we uh, you know, when um, uh, they traveled to, uh, and they were going on their way and they stopped at uh, uh, Jacob's well. And it says in John chapter 4, verse 6, that Jesus was tired from his journey. Um, and this was just, and he sat near that uh, Jacob's well. It was just before he met the Samaritan woman. Uh, we also read in the Gospels that Jesus was hungry. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 19. Um, when Jesus was leaving Bethany, um, uh, you know, uh, Jesus was hungry and he saw a fig tree in the distance. It had leaf on it. But when he went close, uh, you know, anticipating that there would be fruits on it, there was no fruit. We know what uh, he did. He cursed the fig tree. OK. And after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, uh, it says that he was hungry. We read this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, we also see that he uh, faced death like any of us would face death. Um, he died on the cross. Uh, his human body ceased to have life in it and ceased to function. Uh, we read about this in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse uh, 50, where Jesus uh, it says that Jesus cried out loudly and then he died. Okay. And in Luke 24, 39, we also see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we read that uh, Jesus, when he rose again, he had uh, the physical body, um, uh, you know, but it was not the same old physical body that was raised in human weakness and frailties that he had when he died, um, just like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Lazarus or uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, had when when Jesus uh, you know rose them from the dead, but when Jesus rose from the dead, he is uh, he had uh, uh, he no longer had the natural body, but he had the spiritual body, he had the glorified body, um, uh, the incorruptible body. Um, it was not the same like he had before he died, one with weaknesses and frailties. Um, and so we know that he is no longer subject to weaknesses and disease or death. And that is why we read that he is the first fruits of those who have risen from the dead. And so the first fruit means there's more to other fruits to follow. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, benefited uh, by uh, Jesus's resurrection in that that um, when we are raised again back to life, we will be raised with the imperishable, incorruptible uh, um, uh, bodies, bodies that uh, are um, no longer weak, uh, but glorified bodies. Okay. And um, so we see that uh, he was no longer subject to weaknesses, diseases, or death. And um, uh, he ha he was not a ghost or he, when he appeared to his disciples during the 40 day period before his ascension back to heaven, uh, we see that uh, he had a human body, he had hands and feet. Um, and that's what uh, he tells, uh, you know, his disciples when they do not believe that uh, it is truly Jesus. It was his, they thought it was his ghost. He said, touch my hand, my feet, my side. Um, and uh, in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, we read, he says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me and see. And then he says, um, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus when he resurrected, he resurrected with, uh, you know, the, the physical body, but it was a glorified um, a spiritual body that he had. And um, he chose to have the scars on himself, um, you know, so that um, maybe for the reason that his disciples would know that it's truly him. Um, but when we are raised in our glorified um, uh, spiritual bodies, we will bear no uh, scars. Okay. We also see as a human that uh, Jesus um, had a human mind. He increased in wisdom. Uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 52 uh, 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 mentions for us that uh, he increased in wisdom and uh, stature. Uh, can one of you please read Luke chapter 2 verse 52, please? Luke chapter 2 verse 52. 
One of you can read that. Luke chapter 2 verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Thank you. So we see that he increased in wisdom and stature with uh, God and man. Uh, we also see that Jesus had a uh, human um, emotion, just like any one of us. Uh, he says, he said, my soul is troubled. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 27. Uh, we also see, uh, if you read the Gospels, uh, we come across this word uh, compassion uh, very often. Uh, you know, wherever we see Jesus ministering, we see that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the sick, when he saw um, uh, the suffering, when he... Um, you know, when um, uh, when people, the crowd just came to him, he was moved with um, uh, compassion. And we read uh, one instance is Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Can one of you please read Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, please? But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Thank you. So you see that he was moved with compassion when he saw that uh, the people were harassed, when he saw that they were helpless, uh, like sheep without a shepherd. Okay. Uh, we also know that uh, Jesus was, uh, you know, had uh, uh, the emotion of joy. In John chapter 15, verse 11, he, he tells them uh, that... Uh, you know, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay. Uh, we also know that Jesus uh, uh, had uh, was angry. He uh, had the emotion of anger. He showed his anger at times. Um, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, can one of you please read that? Mark chapter 3, verse 5, please. Anyone can read Mark chapter 3, verse 5? <clears throat> and when he had looked around them, uh, look, looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Thank you. So here it was this man, the shrivel hand, and, um, you know, um, uh, it was a Sabbath day, and, uh, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees were waiting to see if Jesus would heal a man on the Sabbath. Uh, so that they could uh, find uh, a fault in him, they could catch him. And uh, Jesus, uh, knowing their thoughts, knowing their intentions, he was deeply, um, you know, uh, distressed uh, at uh, their attitude, at their um, uh, at their uh, mindset, that they did not want this man to be healed. They were so much uh, more legalistic, uh, wanting to follow the laws, which they could not really keep as it is. Uh, but here they did not want this man to be healed. And that is why Jesus was angry. And we see that whenever Jesus was angry, it was not um, uh, uh, like a human anger. Um, and then we could, if he was angry, like we get angry in retaliation or in bitterness or, um, you know, in hatred, in frustration. Um, uh, it was, uh, then we would, uh, you know, we would we can say that Jesus sinned, but his uh, anger was um, uh, was a righteous anger. It was a redemptive anger, uh, and we see that even when he cleansed the temple, uh, it was because they were making his father's house as a marketplace, and all the more because they were selling the animals in the Gentile court. Uh, it was the only place that the Gentiles could come and worship God. So imagine. You know, you're going to worship God, you're going to pray, and this noise of cattle, noise of people uh, talking, laughing, uh, bargaining, and selling. Um, and also that, uh, you know, they were selling those animals at uh, uh, an increased rate compared to the market rate. And so all of this really kind of frustrated uh, or got Jesus angry. It was a righteous anger because they were cheating, they were... Uh, using the Gentile coast, to, which was a place of worship for the Gentiles. They did not even consider the Gentiles as worthy to worship God, using that coat uh, to uh, sell animals. And it was not the place to, uh, to make business in the house 
of uh, God. So we see it was a righteous anger, more redemptive anger. Here also, you know, uh, uh, we see that uh, his anger was righteous and redemptive. And so he tells the man with the shriveled hand, you stretch it, stretch it out, and his he stretched it out, and his hands was complete, and his hand was completely uh, restored. We also see that uh, Jesus was sorrowful. Um, uh, any idea where we, uh, where you read, or where in the Gospels it's mentioned that Jesus was filled with sorrow? At the tomb of Lazarus. Yes, at the tomb of Lazarus. Thank you, uh, John. Where he um, wept when he saw Mary and Martha and all the people uh, weeping. He was filled with sorrow. Jesus wept. Anywhere else? Where Jesus was filled with sorrow. The Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse um, uh, 37 and 38. Can uh, uh, one of you please read that, please? Matthew 26, 37 and 38. Zilatoli, can you please read Matthew 26, 37 and 38? Uh, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciple, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that Jesus was uh, uh, sorrowful and troubled. Why do you think Jesus was sorrowful and troubled? In the Garden of Gethsemane. This is just before he was uh, going to be arrested and then being crucified. So why was Jesus sorrowful? Why do you think Jesus was sorrowful? Was it because he had was going to face a cruel death? Or was it because he was going to be forsaken by his father? Or was it because his disciples were going to uh, abandon him? I think uh, because the, the disciples did not keep awake and pray because he asked them to pray. And they, they did not keep watch to pray. Thank you, Isaac. Isaac says because his disciples did not watch and pray along with him. Anyone else? John, you were going to say something? Or oh, Zilatoli, go ahead. And we'll go to I, John. Um, according to my understanding, he's also uh, just like us. He used to feel pain and also he can see what's going to happen uh, in the future. And, you know, at the time, like, uh, who knows, just my guess, like, uh, uh, in his thought, he might be thinking my father is going to forsake him, something like that. Thank you, Zilatoli. Anyone else? Um, while reading the scriptures that we just read, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 26 um, we read as the part of uh, as Isaac mentioned um, you know, the disciples were supposed to watch and pray with him and uh, and this is the specific word which we see that, and he said to them my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death um, so it's a natural I think it's a human emotion that uh, came up that time uh, just because Jesus was human, uh, that was the reason he was sort of. Thank you. Good inputs. Uh, just my thoughts on it is, uh, you know, he was in his prayer, he was struggling to, you know, complete or do the will of the Father. And finally, he says, Father, not my will be done, but yours be done. And uh, to my understanding, it's because he was going to, you know, be taking on the sins of the entire human 
race. And you know, for someone who is God, he was not just fully human, but he was also fully de- God. He was deity as well. Humanity and deity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, he was uh, sinless. And for him to take on the sins of the entire world, which is so detestable in uh, God's sight, God cannot stand sin. Uh, the minute Adam and Eve sin for us, it could just look at something that was so small, uh, just eating of fruit that God told them not to eat from the tree. Uh, it was. It can look very small to us, uh, uh, you know, the sin of disobedience compared to uh, the great, um, you know, other sins that we can think as a, a greater in magnitude. Um, but, you know, for God, um, uh, sin is sin. Uh, whether it's small, whether it's big. And for uh, Jesus was uh, struggling in this area to, you know, to take on the sins of the entire mankind. It was like that, uh, the day of atonement when the sins of um, uh, the entire uh, 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 Israelite uh, people or nation would be placed on uh, the scapegoat or would be placed on that uh, goat that was a uh, uh, lamb that was to be sacrificed. And Jesus was going to be taking on uh, the sins of the entire human race. And, you know, it, that was the struggle. It was not, uh, I, I know it was not maybe death it was uh, not even being forsaken by the father because he knows he's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, he will be going back to the father but of course he cries out on the cross uh, father father why have you forsaken me it could also be the reason but here the main struggle uh, in my understanding is that you know he had to do the will of the father and he says father not finally when he prays the third time just before he was arrested not my will be uh, not my will but let your will be um, done so it was not that he did not want to die for us or uh, you know uh, or uh, complete doing the will of the father but it was just the whole uh, you know thing of taking on uh, the sins of the entire uh, human race but he took it on himself uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can uh, have become the righteousness of God uh, so that we can have the life of you know, God and that is uh, you know uh, the great God we serve the loving God we serve uh, you know, uh, the merciful and compassionate God uh, we serve, not only somebody who identifies with us, who became human to identify with us, um, who knows uh, what we are going through, but also somebody, uh, you know, who took upon himself our sins, our pain, our sicknesses, our death, so that we can have um, life. And so, you know, we need to rejoice and celebrate that and also live in um, the fullness and live in what Christ has purchased for us on the uh, cross. Okay. We also see that uh, he was tempted as uh, we are. Um, uh, but we know that even though he was tempted just as we are uh, at all points, it says at all points, yet without sin. And I think it's Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 15, uh, you know, Jesus was tempted in all points. So uh, sometimes you might think, you know, um, I've fallen into this temptation, uh, but uh, Jesus does not know what I'm going through because uh, he was just tempted uh, with food and um, power and authority and uh, position and, you know, just uh, worshipping Satan. But, you know, I'm facing even more uh, uh, difficult temptation than what Jesus did. And so he really does not know. But it says here, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Hebrews that if it's written there at all points, you know, it was, uh, we know that the word of God is an inspired word of God and um, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so at all points means he went through every temptation. So like I said, at the beginning of the class, um, uh, you know, many things are not recorded for us in the Gospels. Um, uh, but Jesus would have been tempted in uh, various other areas as well. Um, I'm sure Satan would not have left him. Uh, but it says that he was tempted at all points, just as we are yet without sin. So when we go through temptation, when we are faced with temptation, Jesus knows what we are going through and he's able and is going to, will help us overcome uh, temptation. Okay, so the fact that he um, faced temptation uh, shows that he had a genuine human nature 
uh, that could be tempted. It also shows that even when Jesus was tempted, we too can be tempted. It also shows us that when Jesus overcame temptation, lived sinless, we too can overcome uh, temptation. And uh, I like this whole idea of why uh, the incarnation is because Jesus is our role model. We can always keep looking at him and saying, when Jesus did that, you know, I can also do it. Uh, you know, I also have the Holy Spirit. I also have Jesus to help me, uh, to strengthen me. So whatever area you are facing temptation or struggles or weaknesses, uh, you know, uh, you can also come to this place where you're saying when Jesus as a human did not given or overcame it, I too can overcome it with the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus is there to help me and um, uh, strengthen me. Uh, just like, you know, Jesus, um, I have a friend who says, you know, Jesus was without, uh, he, 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 uh, he was never sick, so we can never be sick. Uh, well, that is a high level of faith that uh, the person has. Um, Jesus was naturally supernatural, so I need to also be naturally supernatural. Uh, so if there's any sickness in my body, I just refuse it. Um, you know, uh, Jesus did not uh, have sicknesses and, um, you know, I too shouldn't have. So that's the level of faith that person has. It's good to have that level of faith um, and uh, have that kind of understanding and walk in it in every area of our life. Uh, we also see that uh, and third area of his humanity was that he was sinless um, um, so uh, New Testament clearly teaches us that Jesus is fully human, just as we are. It also affirms that Jesus was without sin. He never committed sin in his uh, lifetime. Uh, can one of you please read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, please? Sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Thank you. So we see that, uh, uh, you know, Jesus committed no sin and there was no deceit in his mouth. Okay. Now, why was Jesus's full humanity um, necessary? We studied about this in Christology. Any one of you would like to share your thoughts or what you remember? Why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? To become like us, to show that we can also live a life, a victorious Christian life. Okay, uh, to model for us, fine. Uh, it's a perfect role model. What else? Like Bill Johnson says, Jesus uh, Christ is the perfect theology. So anything you want to uh, know is the truth, look back at Jesus' life. He's the perfect theology. Bill John, Pastor Bill Johnson's quote. Yes, so why was it necessary for Jesus to be fully human? When we studied about this in Christology, look at the, the more spiritual aspects. What was the one main, uh, we have a lot of other uh, reasons, but what is the main reason why God had to become man? So that he can go through the temptations. Okay, thank you, Jeffina. Said he could go through the temptations. Why did God have to become man? What was that one main reason? Because men sin. And yeah, that's one. Of, I guess that's one of the reason. And also, 
uh, may need a savior. Thank you, Zilotoli. Yes, uh, what is the, the entire main truth or the central truth of the entire scripture is uh, sin salvation, uh, sin redemption, uh, unrighteousness, uh, you know, unrighteous being made righteous, um, you know, falling short of God's standard, being raised up to God's standard. So we see that in uh, from Genesis, a very beginning how Jesus unfolded the whole plan of salvation, not only from Genesis, but, you know, even before the foundation of the world, uh, uh, the lamb that was slain uh, was also, was already slain before the foundation of the world. I think as we read this in Revelation chapter 3, if I'm not wrong, you know, um, so the plan of salvation was already completed, done thing in the mind of God, but it happened at one point of his in one time and point in history. Um, you know, uh, uh, when God wanted it to be done in the right time, the right season, uh, the Kairos moment. Uh, so we see that happening in history, but it it happened even before uh the foundations of the earth so uh like isaac was uh like asked the question you know why is uh jesus constantly being referred to the lamb of god or why is this lamb of god being continually mentioned is because the central truth or the line of thought or the thread that flows through from genesis 1 right up to the last chapter in revelation uh is uh about uh sin and uh salvation is about how man uh, fell short of the standard of God, uh, you know, uh, and the wrath of God had to be appeased. And so the sacrifice had to be uh, made. So that is something that is a central truth, the main truth of the entire uh, scripture. So we see that um, we could not save ourselves. We are sinless. Uh, we could not save ourselves. And, um, uh, you know, God loves us so much that he did not uh, want us to perish. Uh, and so he unfolded the plan of salvation. And for that uh, uh, plan of salvation, uh, uh, you know, somebody had to make the price or appease God with the sacrifice, make the atonement, uh, the propitiation, make the propitiation for our sins where the wrath of God, um, you know, would be... Um, uh, would be appeased, would uh, be made uh, the suitable, acceptable sacrifice could be made, and um, thereby uh, God's wrath would be turned into his uh, favor. And so we see that only a sinless person uh, can uh, make this uh, sacrifice, and so it was uh, uh, God is the only um, uh, spirit being. Uh, you know, who is uh, sinless, and so he became man, took on the form of a human body, and made uh, the uh, sacrifice. He was a substitute sacrifice. So why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? Uh, the first thing uh, we, uh, we can say is that uh, we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, can one of you please read Romans chapter 5, verse 19, please? Romans 5.19 For as by one's, one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Thank you. So Jesus had to be become a human uh, to be our representative and obey in our place. So through his obedience, uh, you know, uh, we are made righteous through man's disobedience. We were made sinners, but through, uh, uh, through uh, another man's uh, obedience, that is uh, Jesus, who is referred to as the last Adam, uh, we are made uh, righteous. Uh, the second thing uh, is that why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? Was so that he could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the substitute sacrifice. He could be that lamb who made the full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Can one of you please read that? Hebrews chapter 2, verse uh, 16 and 17.
for indeed he does not give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of abraham therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make propitiation for the sins of the people thank you so here we see that um, you know um, he became uh, like us in every manner every respect so that he could be that merciful and faithful high priest uh, who would make uh, the propitiation uh, in some uh, uh, translations is the expiation but the appropriate or more accurate word is the propitiation for the sins of the people propitiation is the sacrifice uh, he made the sacrifice uh, that uh, uh, that bore the wrath of god against sin and uh, thereby uh, you know because he made a full sufficient uh, perfect sacrifice uh, he turns god's wrath into his uh, into god's uh, favor for us so we see that um, um, he had to okay if you look at um, uh, this verse it says therefore he had to be made like his uh brethren so the brethren so there's no other way but he had to be made like us in every way so that he might become the propitiation for us the sacrifice that is the acceptable substitute in our place or the uh, acceptable substitute for us so uh it's important here to realize that unless christ was fully man uh, he could never have died uh, to pay the penalty for man's sin and he could uh, you know uh, he could not have been uh, the substitute sacrifice for us so that's the second thing where he became the substitute sacrifice the third thing is uh, he became the mediator between god and us um uh, uh, and he's the only person who fulfilled the requirement uh and jesus christ was the only one who fulfilled the requirement of being the mediator between um god and us why did he have to be the mediator between god and us any idea was there is only one mediator and he, uh the one who can sympathize with us is god himself thank you there's only one mediator and the one who can sympathize with us is is uh, god who became flesh who understands us okay uh we were all alienated uh from god by our sin uh we needed someone to come between god and ourselves and reconcile us back to god make us friends back with god because we were enemies with god uh we needed a mediator who could represent us uh who could understand us and uh, know us a mediator is always uh you know somebody who's gone through the struggle somebody who knows what we are going through somebody who understands and who can better uh you know stand on behalf of us and so he became that perfect mediator because he became one like us he could understand us and hence he could represent us to god and um uh you know uh and he, and somebody who could represent god also to us so in both ways he was a mediator he could represent god to us and we uh we could understand or know who god is know his heart know his nature uh know his ways uh when we uh, when we saw jesus living here on this earth uh and also he is the perfect representative for us uh before god in heaven okay and we know that he is the only one who could fulfill that uh, requirement um and first timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says there is one god and there is one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus okay so in order to fulfill this role as a mediator jesus became fully man uh, as well as he was fully uh god and like we already said that you know uh he was an example he became an example so that uh, we could follow um and for us for him to be an example to us he had to become fully human uh just like us okay 
Uh, we look at uh, the deity of Christ, of course, uh, uh, on Wednesday when we began looking at this chapter, uh, the doctrine of Christ and of uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we kind of uh, recap what we studied about the deity and the humanity of Christ in Christology. So we'll just very briefly look at the deity of Christ here. Uh, the whole of the New Testament have uh, a lot uh, has a lot of proof about the deity of Christ. Um, so we'll just look at a couple of things. We've already studied quite a lot of them in uh, 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 a number of points in Christology, uh, but we'll just take a few names of God and we'll look at uh, his, uh, uh, that he is a deity, that he was fully uh, man. Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God. Um, so the first, uh, you know, um, uh, name of God we will look at is uh, the word Theos. Uh, anyone knows we studied about the, the names of God in um, in uh, doctrinal foundation systematic theology in our uh, previous classes. Anyone remembers what is the meaning of theos? God. Thank you. Um, it's God. Um, um, we read that in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with Theos, okay, Theos, God. Um, so it's usually referred in the New Testament uh, for God the Father, okay, this word uh, Theos. Uh, so what is the word for uh, Theos in uh, the Old Testament? Theos is the name for God in the New Testament, uh, where it refers to God the Father, but we'll also look at places where this word Theos is also referring to uh, Jesus Christ, the same name that is ascribed to God the Father, the Old Testament also ascribed to God the Son. Uh, so what is the equivalent name of Theos in, uh, or what is, how is God called in the Old Testament? Elohim, okay. Uh, I said, of course, Yahweh. They would not uh, uh, speak the name, but Elohim uh, is uh, is the is the uh, term used for God only for God and not for anyone else. Uh, the equivalent word for Elohim that's in the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament is Theos, uh, and it's referred to God the Father, but also in several places. Uh, like in John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, John chapter 20, verse 28, Romans chapter 9, verse 5, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, it, uh, the same term theos, uh, which is used to refer to God the Father, is also used to refer to uh, God the Son, that is uh, Jesus Christ, okay? So would uh, some of, one of you please read... Um, um, John chapter 1 was 18, uh, John chapter 20 was 28, someone else can read, and Romans chapter 9 was 5, please. John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Thank you. So no one has ever seen God um, so that is, no one has ever seen Theos and the one and only son who is himself Theos. Okay, so uh, here the first Theos is talking about God the Father. The second Theos is talking about God the Son. Okay, uh, John chapter 20 was 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Thank you. So here, uh, you know, when Thomas uh, realizes that it is Jesus, uh, he says, my Lord and my God, the word theos there. Okay. Uh, someone else can read Romans 9, 5, please. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Thank you. So there's are the patriarchs, from there strays the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, who's Theos, 
overall uh, forever uh, place. So whenever we read in the Greek lexic, in the Greek Bible, you know, uh, the Septuagint, whenever they used to read uh, this word Theos, they knew that it's referring to uh, uh, God the Father. But uh, when it is ascribed to the Son, it also shows that uh, Jesus is uh, uh, God. Okay. Uh, the second uh, name for God is uh, Kyrios or Kurios, we already studied about uh, this uh, term Kurios. Anyone remembers what's the meaning of Kurios or uh, uh, Kyrios? Anyone remembers? We had learned, uh, learned it as Kurios. Kurios is the Greek uh, form of uh, uh, the term of God, Adonai. Okay, Adonai uh, means Lord or Sovereign. Uh, it's, uh, it's a term that is used to call uh, people, uh, human beings who are masters or uh, owners or authority, uh, uh, people in places of authority. It's also a, a term that is used for God, uh, a title that used for God. So it's a title used both for men and uh, for God. Uh, so in the Old Testament, it's Adonai. So places where you read Adonai, it can also be a title referred to men and also to God himself. But Elohim, Theos is Yahweh is exclusively just used for God. And uh, Kurios is the Greek uh, form of um, uh, uh, the Hebrew uh, term uh, Adonai. Okay. Or uh, it's also, we can also say it as Kyrios. Okay. And we see that uh, this term is used for Jesus Christ as well. Um, so if we look at uh, the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint is basically the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, or we see that um, uh, this word uh, Kyrios or Kurios that is used for uh, God the Father, or uh, you know, is used for Christ as well. And um, it's also uh, from uh, you know uh, this word. Um, uh, we also get the Hebrew word Yahweh. Okay, so there are many instances in the New Testament where this word is used for Christ. So whenever these uh, Greek um, speaking people, when they used to read uh, the Septuagint and they had an idea of uh, the Old Testament, wherever they used to read this word kurios, kirios, they knew it was uh, uh, the word used for Yahweh. So it had a very strong sense, a strong uh, uh, word, a strong meaning uh, for them. Them, um, uh, because they knew that this, uh, you know, uh, it this is what was the meaning for in the Old Testament. So we see that um, um, uh, this word Yahweh, or you know, when it's translated Yahweh, or the word Kurios, uh, which uh, also means Yahweh, uh, is also referred to in the New Testament. Uh, and so we see that, uh, you know, it proves that Jesus is deity, that he is um, God. Okay. So we look at uh, the verses um, where we find this uh, term kurios uh, uh, referred to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Uh, uh, in our next class on Wednesday, we'll stop here. Um, uh, we just have two more minutes. So just a few things. Uh, I hope all of you have received your uh, grades for your Christology test. Yes, no. Yes, any yes. anyone has to still receive it? Yes, I have received it. Okay. Uh, I'm sure some of you are disappointed with uh, the grades. I was quite uh, myself, but it's just the first test. It... Uh, assessment. Um, you'll have two more to go. Uh, so wherever you have missed out, um, uh, you know, or if you've not written the right answer or you missed out a few points, I have added the points in the, uh, 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 in the section there and I've emailed it to you. So uh, in the feedback uh, box, I have uh, put my uh, put the answer the right answer so please take time to read the right answer uh, uh, you know uh, many of you have lost marks in the first uh, the long question I said you know uh, it's important to use theological terms 
uh, we need to you need to come to that understanding that you all are theological students and uh, you just can't uh, answer like a lay person does. Uh, you know, if a lay person answered uh, or gave the answers you had given, then they would have got uh, uh, good marks. But um, it's important as theological students to, uh, you know, to uh, make sure that you are uh, giving the uh, theological proofs that are necessary or adequate uh, to um, uh, you know, reason with some uh, an unbeliever to prove that Jesus is deity. Okay, uh, so that is why some of you lost points, and some of the points that you missed out, I have put it in the in the in the uh, feedback box. Those of you who got full answers, uh, full marks for the answers, I have not uh, put in the right answers because you have already, um, uh, you know, uh, mentioned everything that is necessary. I think uh, most of you lost points in uh, you did not mention that uh, you know the essence. Jesus has the same essence or the same uh, nature, the characteristic, the attribute attributes as God himself. Uh, he was in the bosom of the Father. He was very intimate with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And you miss talking about the Zoe life, the life that God has in him uh, self, the eternal, full existent, uh, self-existent, self-sufficient life. Also, you missed out on uh, the I am uh, the the right meaning of it, mighty God is the um, is the omnipotent one, which some of you had missed out on that as well. Uh, if you have looked at your answers, which I have sent, and you still feel you 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 know need more marks, then please feel free to uh, write to me. Um, and I will recheck, but I have taken uh, time to look at each of your answers. I've been a little gracious in giving you marks. I've not cut marks for those of you who sent in your assign, uh, assessment in late. Okay. Uh, today is your doctoral foundation uh, assessment. I will post it uh, by 5.30 this evening uh, or even before that. Uh, your, uh, the due date is Monday, uh, which is um, Monday is the... Uh, 7th uh, March, and please send it in by 5 uh, p.m. IST, okay? Uh, so all the best for your uh, doctoral foundation test, and uh, have a good day and a good weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Anyone has any doubts or any questions? Anything you'd like to share? No? Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, it's already late for your next class. Uh, thank you for joining class today. Have a blessed day and a blessed weekend. Bye.